Secret Agent Mother. The Negro lady with the snappy oval bag didn't give us a glance as she click clacked on by. That was fine with me, although I'd tell Big Ma otherwise if she asked, just to keep her from worrying, and I'd make it short and simple. I only get caught if I try to spin too much straw. With both feet safely on the ground, Vanetta became her old self, her face shiny and searching. What do we call her? I'd gone over this with Vanetta and Fern many, many times. I told them long before Papa said we were going to meet her. I told them while we packed our suitcases. Her name is Cecile. That's what you call her. When people ask who she is, you say, she is our mother. Mother is a statement of fact. Cecile Johnson gave birth to us. We came out of Cecile Johnson. In the animal kingdom, that makes her our mother. Every mammal on the planet has a mother, dead or alive, ran off or stayed put. Cecile Johnson, mammal birth giver, alive, an abandoner, is our mother, a statement of fact. Even in the song we sing, when we miss having a mother, and not her, but a mother, period, we sing about a mother. Mother's gotta go now, la, 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 la. Never mommy, mom, mama, or ma. Mommy gets up to give you a glass of water in the middle of the night. Mom invites your friends inside when it's raining. Mama burns your ears with a hot comb to make your hair look pretty for class picture day. Ma is sore and worn out from wringing your, dry, from wringing your wet clothes and hanging them to dry. Ma needs peace and quiet at the end of the day. We don't have one of those. We have a statement of fact. Vanetta, Fern, and I stood next to the young red-headed stewardess assigned to watch us until, Ce until Cecile came forward. The stewardess reread the slip of paper in her hand, then eyed the big clock mounted by the arrival and departure board, as if she had someplace else to be. She could have left me alone with my sisters. I certainly didn't need her. A man in navy overall swept garbage off the floor a few feet away from us. He went about his job with no expression, sweeping cigarette packs and gum wrappers into a dustpan that he emptied into a larger trash can. If I were him, picking up after people who carelessly drop stuff on the ground, I'd be nothing but angry. They call it littering when you carelessly drop things. They call the careless folks who drop things by a cute name, litterbug. There's nothing cute about dropping things carelessly. Dropping garbage and having puppies shouldn't be called the same thing litter. I had a mind to write to Miss Webster about that. Puppies don't deserve to be called a litter like they had been dropped carelessly like garbage. And people who litter shouldn't be given a cute name for what they do. And at least the mother of a litter sticks around and nurses her pups no matter how sharp their teeth are. Miriam Webster was falling down on the job. How could she have gotten this wrong? Vanetta asked me again, not because she was anxious to meet Cecile. Vanetta asked again so she could have her routine rehearsed in her head, her curtsy, smile, and greeting, leaving Fern and me to stand around like dumb dodos. She was practicing her role as the cute, bouncy pup in the litter and asked yet again, Delphine, what do we call her? A large white woman came and stood before us, clapping her hands like we were on display at the Bronx Zoo. Oh my, what adorable dolls you are. My, my, she warbled like an opera singer. Her face was moon full and jelly soft, the cheeks and jaw framed by white whiskers. We said nothing. And so well behaved. Vanetta perked up to out pretty and out behave us. I did as Big Ma had told me in our many talks on how to act around white people. I said, thank you, but I didn't add the ma'am for the whole, thank you, ma'am. I'd never heard anyone else say it in Brooklyn, only in old movies on TV. And when we drove down to Alabama, people say, yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am, in Alabama all the time. That old word was perfectly fine for Big Ma. It just wasn't perfectly fine for me. The lady opened her pocketbook, took out a red leather change purse, and scooted coins around, searching for the right amount for adorable, well-behaved colored dolls. Big Ma would have thought that was grand, but Papa wouldn't have liked it one cent. 
Now it was time to do what Papa had told me. See after my sisters. We're not allowed to take money from strangers. I said this polite enough to suit Big Ma, but strong enough to suit Papa. The red-headed stewardess was appalled by my uppity behavior. Don't you know when someone is being nice to you? I put on my dumb dodo face to fake not knowing what she meant. What was the sense of making the stewardess stand guard over us if she refused to protect us from strangers? She thought it was all right to have the large white woman gawk at us, talk to us, and buy our attention. We might as well have stood by ourselves. I didn't have to shift my eyes to see mile-long pouts on Vanetta and Fern. I didn't care. We weren't taking nothing from no strangers. The lady was all smiles and squeals. Her face shook with laughter. Oh, and so cute. She put all the nickels in Fern's hand and pinched her cheek faster than I could do anything about it and was gone, as big as she was. Vanetta grabbed Fern's hand, forced it open, and took her nickel, leaving our two coins in Fern's palm. No use telling them to hand the money over. They were already dreaming of penny candy. I let them keep their nickels and mine. The stewardess re-examined the slip of paper. She shifted from one leg to the other. Both my sisters and me and her high heels were bothering her. I looked around the crowd of people pacing and waiting. Papa didn't keep any pictures of Cecile, but I had a sense of her. Fuzzy flashes of her always came and went, but I knew she was big, as in tall, and Hershey colored like me. I knew I at least had that right. Then something made me look over to my left at a figure standing by the cigarette machine. She moved, then moved back, maybe deciding whether to come to us or not. I told the stewardess before the figure could slip out of the airport. That's her. Fern and Vanetta were excited and scared. They squeezed my hands tight. I could see any thoughts Vanetta had about reciting poetry, tap dancing, and curtsying vanished. She squeezed my hand harder than Fern did. The stewardess marched us on over to this figure. Once we were there, face to face, the stewardess stopped in her tracks and made herself a barrier between the strange woman and us. The same stewardess who let the large white woman gawk at us and press money into Fern's hand wasn't so quick to hand us over to the woman I said was our mother. I wanted to be mad, but I couldn't say I blamed her entirely. It could have been the way the woman was dressed. Big black shades, scarf tied around her head. Over the scarf, a big hat tilted down. The kind Pa wore with a suit, a pair of man's pants. Fern clung to me. Cecile looked more like a secret agent than a mother, but I knew she was Cecile. I knew she was our mother. Are you? The stewardess unfurled the crumpled slip, slip of paper. Cecile Johnson? She paused heavily between the first and last names. Are you these colored girls' mama? Cecile looked at us, then at the stewardess. I'm Cecile Johnson. These, she motioned to us, are mine. That was all the stewardess needed to hear. She dropped the slip of paper on the floor, handed us over, and fled away on her wobbly high heels. Cecile didn't bother to grab any of our bags. She said, come on, took two wide steps, and we came. The gap between Cecile and us spread wider and wider. Vanetta sped up, but was annoyed that she had to. Fern could only go so fast with her bag in one hand and Miss Patty Cake in the other. And I wasn't going anywhere without Vanetta or Fern, so I slowed down. Cecile finally turned as she got to the glass doors and looked to see where we were. When we caught up, she said, y'all have to move if you're going to be with me. Fern needs help, I told her. Then Fern said, I do not. And Vanetta said, I need help. Cecile's face had no expression. She swooped down, grabbed Fern's bag handle, and said, Y'all keep up. She started walking, the same wide steps as before. I took Fern's hand, and we all followed. The gap wasn't as wide as when we first started out, but there was distance between Cecile and my sisters and me. Mobs easily threaded through and around us. You couldn't see we were together. There was something uncommon about Cecile. Eyes glommed onto her, tall, dark brown woman in man's pants whose face was half hidden by a scarf, hat, and big dark shades. 
She was like a colored movie star, tall, mysterious, and on the run. Mata Hari in the airport, except there weren't any cameras or spies following the colored, broad-shouldered Mata Hari. Only three girls trailing her from a slight distance. We followed her outside, where green and white cabs lined up. Instead of going to the first cab in the line, Cecile ducked her head and searched every other cab. It was at the fourth cab that she bent down and rapped against the window. The driver, wearing a black beret, leaned over, nodded, unlocked the, door, unlocked the front door, and said something like, Zilla, which I guess was short for Cecile in a colored Oakland way. Cecile opened the back door. Come on, I asked. Can we put our bags in the... Girl, will you get in this car? Vanetta and Fern stiffened. Big Ma could be hard. Papa didn't play around. But no one talked to me like that. It was just as Big Ma had said. We were in a boiling pot of trouble cooking. Still, there was no time to soothe my pride. I had to make everything all right for Vanetta and Fern so they'd fall in line. I got in first with my bag, pulling Fern in with me while she held on to Miss Pattycake. And then Vanetta got in with her bag. Cecile and the cab driver lit up cigarettes as we drove on. At least Papa doesn't smoke his viceroys in the wildcat. Vanetta coughed and Fern looked green. I didn't bother to ask what I could and could not do. I cranked down my window to let the air in. We were quiet, riding along, gazing out the windows at Oakland and stealing looks at, Ce at Cecile. Before I could get a thought going about Cecile or Oakland, the cab driver let us out not too far from the airport. You live near the airport, Vanetta asked. Cecile didn't answer. She just said, come on. As we walked, she hid deeper into her hat and shades, like she didn't want anyone to see her with us. Was she ashamed she had three girls she'd left behind and had to explain? Who are these girls? Yours? Why don't they live with you? Don't expect no pity from us. We were asked the same questions in Brooklyn. Where's your mother? Why don't she live with you? Is it true she died? Cecile placed Fern's suitcase on the bench of a bus stop and sat down. Why are we taking the bus? Vanetta asked. Why didn't the cab take us? I shushed I shushed Vanetta just to keep Cecile from saying something mean. By my time X, the bus came in four minutes. Cecile made us get on first and said, go all the way to the back and sit down. When we found seats, Cecile was still with the bus driver, arguing with him. Ten and under ride for free, she said. Now give me four transfers. I had been 11 for a good while, standing tall. But I said to Vanetta and Fern, if anyone asks, I'm 10. Vanetta folded her arms. Well, I'm still nine. I am not going back to eight. Fern said, I'm staying seven. I hushed them both down. A lot of good it did if the bus driver heard us getting our ages straight. Tell the truth, it was Cecile I worried about, not the driver. We didn't have to stay with the bus driver for the next 28 days. We had to stay with Cecile.